Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of Six Degrees of Gaming, the show where I select two games from my collection at random and have to transform one into the other in exactly six steps. This time, we'll start with the Final Fantasy Tactics and end on Hotline Miami. This is without a doubt one of the greatest games of all time. I didn't really get into JRPGs until later in life, so as a kid I had heard of the Final Fantasy series and seen the games at friends' houses, but never actually played them myself. As a result, FFT was the first Final Fantasy game I completed, though it's really more of a spin-off. See, one day a friend gave me a copy of Final Fantasy Tactics, complaining that it was way too complicated for them and they thought maybe I would like it. Yeah, I liked it. I liked it a lot. Some people are bored by turn-based combat, but personally, I love it. This is a thinking man's game that requires planning and consideration of many factors during battle. The way the game is structured, you can build your party any way you like by changing your character's jobs, essentially their class, between battles. This eventually allows them to mix and match a wide variety of skills. There are also ways to permanently modify your character's brave and faith, which are a measure of physical and magical aptitude, respectively. These things, along with positioning, equipment, and even the compatibility of characters' zodiac signs, determines effectiveness in battle. I've played through this game over and over, each time issuing myself a different challenge. It's possible, for instance, though extremely difficult, to complete the game using only a single character. Sometimes I would only allow myself to use one class, like a party of only calculators, who conquer their enemies with the magic of mathematics. I think my favorite class, and perhaps the most viable for a homogenous party like this, was the Monk. High damage, attacks that hit multiple targets at range, a skill that restores health and magic, and even the power to resurrect fallen allies. Monks were the best. And hey, speaking of spin-offs from major gaming franchises where you play monks... Mortal Kombat! Mortal Kombat Shaolin Monks on the PlayStation 2 was a spin-off of the gory fighting game franchise which started on arcade machines back in the early 90s. Here, you've got more of a co-op action-adventure brawler where you control series regulars Liu Kang and Kung Lao. I'll admit, I had never heard of this game until the replay crew over at Game Informer started playing it recently. Turns out it's pretty awesome. All right, keep the combat the is quite free. satisfying, and there's always lots of environmental hazards to throw hapless enemies into and watch them evaporate into a fine red mist. As the game goes on, you can unlock more and more movement abilities, special attacks, and combos. Of course, there are the series' trademark bloody fatalities, many of them completely ridiculous. Was, he looks like a guy that loves rabbits. Hey, man. Hi. <laughs> no, I'm good. <laughs> I don't need that rabbit. <laughs> Jeez, Louise. While we're on the subject of the ridiculous, the cutscenes in the game are hilarious, with halting dialogue that seems like it was pulled right out of a poorly dubbed kung fu movie. You killed reptile. Yes, we did. This is very good. <laughs> Along the way, tons of characters from the Mortal Kombat universe make appearances, with several acting as the game's boss encounters. One memorable section has you trying to fight your way through to face Reptile, while a giant snake slithers in and out of the room and knocks you off the platforms. I don't know about you, but when I see a giant snake, I immediately think of this. Perhaps you'd like to see how snake-like I can be! Aladdin is one of my favorite Disney movies. It helps that my family happened to take a trip to Disneyland right around the time it released, and so a ton of the coolest stuff there at the time was Aladdin-themed. Given the quality of most movie-based games, it was surprising that Aladdin got a fairly solid video game adaptation. In fact, you could say it got two. So this was back in the days when the same game would sometimes have totally different versions depending on which system you played it on. In the case of Aladdin, there's a long-standing debate over whether the Super Nintendo version or the Sega Genesis version is superior. I think most people prefer the Genesis version, which has more detailed animations and a bit more complexity to the level design. For me though, it was the SNES version that I played as a kid, and that's the one that I still prefer for its nostalgic value. It's funny going back to it now though. Back then I remember having a real tough time with parts like the magic carpet lava escape, but now as a grown up it seems super easy. I was able to beat the whole game in a total of about 40 minutes. It does seem like the Super Nintendo version was aimed at a slightly younger audience, and so it was a lot more lighthearted. For example, on Super Nintendo you would do the standard jump on enemies' heads to take them out, whereas on the Genesis you would straight up murder them with a scimitar. Anyway, one thing both games had in common was the ability to collect apples and use them as ranged projectiles, which is something that you also do in... 
Pokemon Snap. Man, what a weird game Pokemon Snap was. I remember I had one friend in particular who was really into it. When I was over at his house, I watched him play it a bit, and I just didn't get it. The whole point of the game is just to take pictures of Pokemon? That's it? Really? I had never seen a game like this, and I had a hard time wrapping my head around it. He let me borrow the game and made me promise to give it a good chance, so I did, and wouldn't you know it, I got hooked. The game starts off, and super creepy Professor Oak Hello there. invites you alone to his secluded island, presumably to, you know, show you his diglet. In fact, he wants you to take photos of his diglet along with every other Pokémon you can find. He sends you out to do so, and the levels play out like an on-rails shooter. The motorized bug you're in keeps on moving, which gives you limited time to snap photos as you pass by. That's where the apples would come in. You could toss them out to either lure out hiding Pokémon or to stun them in place. At the end, you'd pick your best photos and submit them to Professor Oak, who would judge them based on their composition. Of course, Oak was a nitpicky hardass about it. You were close! Oh, you missed it doing that one pose that it only does for a fraction of a second? Too bad, points deducted. You were close! This is exactly why Pokemon Snap was so addictive. I'd replay sections again and again just to get that one shot. It finally let me say, There, Oak, you happy? It's perfect! Wonderful! It really was a weird game, but it was a lot of fun. Of course, a few years later, I would play another game in which I was judged on my photography. But this time, I was taking pictures of a far more gruesome subject matter. In Dead Rising, one of the ways you can earn experience in the form of prestige points is via photography. This makes sense because you play a photojournalist, Frank West, and you're dropped off by helicopter atop the shopping mall in the fictional town of Willamette, Colorado. The town has been sealed off by the National Guard, and you're there to find out why. Spoiler, it's because of zombies. Zombies are no good! Lots and lots and lots of zombies. In fact, the sheer number of zombies that could be displayed on the screen at one time was an impressive technical achievement. Where Dead Rising really shows its unique style is in the many ways that you can choose to deal with the zombie hordes. Almost everything you come across in the mall can be used as a weapon. Of course, some are far more effective than others. It's easy to lose yourself in the zany zombie slaying action and forget all about completing the main mission objectives. The thing about Dead Rising, though, is that you actually have a limited amount of time to complete the game. You see, the rendezvous with the helicopter for extraction is set exactly 72 hours after the initial drop-off. Time progresses at 12 times its normal rate inside the game, which means you really only have 6 hours to play. There are several different possible endings, and which one you get depends on exactly how much you're able to accomplish in that time. What do you mean it's not over? Fortunately, upgrades gained by way of leveling up are carried over when you start a new game, allowing you to accomplish more and more in subsequent playthroughs. A hard deadline of three days to finish the entire game? Yeah. Now where have I seen that before? So why don't you just tell me already? <laughs> ah yes. Majora's Mask really stressed me out when I first played it. For one thing, it features a character even more creepy than Professor Oak. Once again, you have just three days to finish the game, or this incredibly terrifying moon will crash right into the planet killing absolutely everyone in a catastrophic, apocalyptic event. So, you know, no pressure or anything. Time in this game moves even faster than it does in Dead Rising. I want to say that you only really had about an hour in real time to stop the moon and save the world. Of course, it wasn't as tough as that makes it sound. Inasmuch as you're the hero of time, with your trusty ocarina, it's possible to alter the flow of time and even reverse it to give yourself a chance to go back and complete more of the game's quests. Some things wouldn't stay with you when you went back in time, but others would, allowing you to gradually become more powerful with each loop. I eventually learned to love the time mechanic, and I look back at Majora's Mask now fondly as a brilliant masterpiece of game design. At the time, though, it was fairly frustrating to have to repeat tasks if I didn't make it to a certain point at which the necessary progress was locked down. I'm quite sure that I never would have finished it had I not started using a guide partway through. As you progress, you build up a collection of special masks that grant Link a variety of abilities. The most dramatic are the transformation masks, which shapeshift Link completely and open up entirely new movesets. Other masks are more subtle, doing things like granting a speed bonus or the ability to see hidden objects. And yes, this all reminds me quite a bit of a much more recent game in which masks grant special powers. Hotline Miami I was genuinely surprised by just how much I loved Hotline Miami. 
Motivated by nothing more than a cryptic phone call, you don an animalistic mask and drive to a location to, well, brutally slaughter everyone inside. The violence is over the top and downright repulsive at times. Throw in the constant motion of the wavy retro-inspired graphics and it seems like the game is actively trying to nauseate the player. There are a number of huge WTF moments that had me wondering just what the hell was going on? Why am I doing this? Is any of this even real? In the moment when the adrenaline kicks in though, none of that matters. As far as the gameplay, it's hectic. Death can happen in a split second, but the respawns are just as instantaneous. Each death is a learning moment that informs the plan for your next attempt. When you finally pull off the perfect sequence and flawlessly take down an entire room in seconds, it's such a rush. Of course, a big part of the appeal of Hotline Miami is its absolutely superb soundtrack. It fits the mood of the game perfectly, vacillating between pulse-pumping beats and slow, unsettling tunes evocative of a crazy drug trip. Hotline Miami is a twisted game that is all at once disturbing, thrilling, confusing, and ultimately one of the more fun and memorable indie games I've ever played. So to recap, Final Fantasy Tactics is a spin-off of a successful video game franchise in which you play as monks, and so is Mortal Kombat Shaolin Monks, in which you have to take down a giant snake, like in Aladdin, where you throw apples much as you do in Pokemon Snap. Getting points based on the composition of your photographs comes back in Dead Rising. You only have three days to complete that game, the same amount as in The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, in which you wear a variety of masks that grant different abilities just like Hotline Miami. That does it for this round of Six Degrees of Gaming. If you enjoyed this episode, I'm happy for you. And hey, maybe you'll enjoy the next one too. Until then, thanks for watching.